So I think we have 30 minutes to do this, so I think we're going to jump in. I've got like five questions and maybe more, and I don't think I want to waste a lot of time. One thing, uh, you know, when we do these kinds of interviews, a lot of times they say, oh, the Army's at a critical moment. It actually is because a lot's going on, and, you know, we'll see what a Trump Pentagon will mean for the Army. But one particular question I wanted to ask was, um, the campaign has signaled that it doesn't like some of the, their words, social engineering in the military, including women in combat, transgender. Wondering what your thoughts are on, is it too late to roll back that, some, some of those initiatives? Are they too far along? What are your thoughts? First, let me say, I, I've never liked the word engineering when it comes to this, because I, I think what we're doing is just building off of shared values of opportunity and inclusion. Um, and and the, the path to do this over decades, you know, going back to integration of the military, uh, has never been purely linear, but I do think um, it, it's very hard to roll things back completely for a number of reasons. Society is changing very quickly. The soldiers, we assess just in the active component, 60,000 soldiers a year. Um, they come out of a different society than I came out of. And, um, and so that, that's one aspect. The other aspect is when you're leaning in or looking into making some of these changes, the debate is whether or not you're going to let someone wear a uniform, which is a very different discussion than whether or not you're going to make someone take the uniform off. So I do think um, uh, this, this tide is moving forward and is, is difficult to stop. That doesn't mean it doesn't have pivots and ups and downs and so forth. But I feel pretty confident that, um, that these changes in this direction is here to stay. Is the, um, is the uh, transgender initiative uh, more in its nascency and so maybe easier? Because these guys uh, potentially come in and say, we've got a new, new plan, which is to undo the old plan. Sure, any, anything that is newest or is, you know, in, in the early stages is, is easier to unwind or to change. But a couple of things. One, in many ways, these policies we're coming up with are just catching up with what's already happening out there. Um, we already have transgender, solar sailors, airmen, and marine. And um, trying to find a way for them to serve with dignity and for commanders to give some help and guidance to commanders who were being left to figure this out on their own was really the, the goal we had in mind here. Uh, and it is all the science now, the medical community treats it as a medical issue, which is how we're treating it. And that, that's a hard thing to walk back. And th the other thing is the, the numbers just aren't what people uh, thought they would be or expected they would be. And I think. What we see over and over and over again, um, certainly in this administration, starting with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, is these implementations are actually pretty smooth. Okay. One last one on that. Is it, it, is it possible, and this is kind of above your pay grade, but um, you know, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force on women in combat had kind of a general view of it. Uh, Marines may be a different. Um, can you imagine? Uh, some services going one way and other services emphasizing in, you know, going in a different direction? Yeah, I think in almost anything you can imagine that. That's one of the, you know, the, one of those questions that's always out there, why do we have four services? Why don't we just consolidate to one? Well, each of those four services is pretty immense. Uh, the Army is the second largest employer in the country behind Walmart. Uh, and, and part of the value and the beauty of that is that you have some competition and some different ways of doing things and you can learn from each other. And so in all areas, you see the services uh, doing it a little bit differently. Okay. Um, uh, as far as I know, uh, the Trump uh, campaign or the transition folks have not made an appointment with the Pentagon to talk transition yet, uh, let alone the Army. But just kind of generally speaking, and as I was saying to you backstage, like there might have been an expectation that you might have stayed on a little bit longer. You had things you wanted to do, things that are probably not yet complete. So kind of two questions in one. Like, what's your message to the transition people when you do talk to them? And what are the things that you had hoped to do that you're hoping they will continue? Gordon, you always have at least two questions in yeah. one. Um, so the, the, I, I've worked kind of on the incoming side of two transitions, uh, Clinton in 93 and then uh, was early in in Obama. 
And, uh, and as is the case in every transition, the main message is we're here and we will do whatever is necessary to make this as smooth as possible. And that we have 100,000 soldiers outside of the country right now in 150 different countries. Um, in combat, in harm's way. Uh, there can be no gaps, there can be no seams, and that is the first and only priority, and we're completely dedicated to that. And whenever they're ready to talk, um, we will do whatever uh, they need us to do to make the transition as smooth and fulsome as possible. Um, and as for me, thinking about whether I was going to stay or not stay, uh, I've, I've done this long enough to know that what you hear in November isn't necessarily what you see in January. And so I wasn't, you know, I, I had thoughts about what I would do if there was a longer tenure, but I was also approaching the year to make sure that whatever I was working on um, at least would leave some modules that were complete and can be built on or had what I, what I call escape velocity. It would, it would continue after I left. But I think what I was really focused on, and we'll, and we'll talk to whomever replaces me um, if he or she wants to talk about that, was further defining what the Army needs in the future. The, the Army in the last 15 years really has been pulled into the day, day after day after day after day, um, stripped a lot of investment out of the future, even a lot of the intellectual process of thinking about the future. So really with General Milley focused on what the Army needs in the future and then trying to make sure the Army was structured to deliver on that. Uh, we have a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation in soldiers, in our civilians. Uh, and there are a lot of things the Army does really well, despite the processes that we have in place and the barriers um, that we put in front of those innovative and creative people. And so trying to help structure, restructure the Army um, for the way innovation exists today and technology is fielded today so that we can deliver on that vision for the future were kind of the two things um, that were really uh, in the back of my mind. And then thirdly, because you're always thinking about your people, really wanting to think about behavioral health very differently. The, the Army has done a lot to move behavioral health out into uh, the operational level so that it's there if it's needed. But I think we need to fundamentally shift the paradigm here, which is not there is help if you need it, but of course you're going to need help. And, and Special Operations Command has done a lot of work in this, actually, that, that this should be an expectation based on what we ask a soldier to do day after day after day after day, deployment after deployment, um, that it's not there if you need it, you're going to need it, and it's a part of your program when you return. When that destigmatizes it so yeah. that nobody has to say, like, raise their hand, and that's a, what, uh, and I had a question about Special Forces folks, but, um, that community is a smaller community that, where they can kind of road test ideas and be kind of innovative when it comes to resilience and that kind of stuff. How can you, or how would you hope that maybe somebody would expand that model to the, to big army? Well, there's a, I, I think first of all, it's expanding the model of big army, but it's also thinking about the, the transition from when you're a soldier to becoming a veteran because we are, we've been focused on this for years now. Uh, there's a lot of research underway, there are a lot of new programs underway, there's a lot more to do to understand PTS, traumatic brain injury, how you should treat it. Um, and, and the veterans medical community focuses on, for a number of very valid reasons, different things. And so I think there's some things that we can do that the two medical communities maybe to overlap on that transition a little bit more. But in terms of institutionalizing, I mean, special operations is smaller than, than the Army. It's a lot bigger than it used to be. And so they've shown you can scale some of these things and how they acquire weapons and what they do on behavioral health. But you know, the analogy is what, what, when, we, when we run a platform hard, we bring it back, we strip it down, and you know, put it back together. And I think um, we need to think about our soldiers that way. And, and Special Operations has been doing this for a while. What is, you know, uh, Special Operations forces have been kind of the force of choice, certainly for this administration um, over the years. Um, but a guy was telling us the other day that, you know, when we look at the operations in Mosul and then soon kind of more expansively in Raqqa, you know, that frankly, some of these uh, SF guys are, you know, stretched a little bit, not stretched too thin, the person was careful to say, but, um, but uh, clearly like, there's some wear there. Can you talk a little bit more about how to address those, particularly in that community, how to address that stretch? Well, I, we, I, you know, Army Special Forces and U.S. Special Forces are an incredibly lethal 
power. It's amazing what they can do and, and what they do um, many times a day, day after day after day. We are working them really hard. Uh, Army Special Operations Command uh, is putting a plan together to, it has a plan together to, to, to mitigate this, which is a whole series of things, behavioral health, family programs, um, really trying to focus on how we can sustain readiness, because that's part of the problem. When you're running this hard, you're impacting your readiness. Uh, and we need to keep doing more on that. But part of what we've recognized, too, is as, as amazingly capable as our special uh, forces are, in partnership with a lot of other countries' special forces, they can't do everything. Um, you, need, you need your full army, and you need the, the, the joint force um, to have the total and long-standing effect that you want. Um, uh, do you see... Um other kind of major muscle movements that need to kind of occur to, you know, assuming the new folks come in and say, we want to use, continue to use these guys at this kind of rate, like what kind of major muscle movements might you even recommend to the transition folks about what they should consider doing to kind of set those guys up? Well, I think, I, I mean, I, I support the, the strategic plan the president has in place now. I mean, you can use special forces, you can send them in night after night after night after night, um, but you need something else to, to clear ground and then something else altogether to hold ground. And so that's why for the second element, you need your larger conventional army. And for the third element, you need to be develop these other, these countries that we're in need to be developing forces. And so that's why a large, a large percentage of, of our effort and our people are, are in Afghanistan, in Iraq, helping build the police, build the military, because something other than us needs to hold whatever we've gained. Um, Segue to a, uh, a size question. Size always matters with the Army in particular. Um, I think you're going to 450. 450, that, right. for, in the active In the active, in the active side, let's yeah. not forget our friends in the reserve and the other group. Um, uh, but as you go to 450, I think that the kind of number that I think some Army leaders had embraced was more like 490. Uh, talk about, you know, and I should say, new demands on the Army in particular with the contribution to NATO that starts, I think, this year, about a thousand folks. And then you've got a heavy brigade on rotation, six to nine months going in and out of Europe. But if you, if you count it differently, it's really like a division because one's on the staff, one's there, and one's regenerating. Right. So a lot of demand there. So can you address you know, kind of the size of the Army and also what's the analysis that's been done to kind of uh, defend those numbers? Because I think that's one criticism that sometimes the Army just says, hey, let's do more numbers, but the capabilities question is left aside. Wow, there's a lot more than two questions in that one. I know, uh, right? I'll come back so to I'll start. I'll start by saying when I, when I moved to the Army last year on, on my first tour, uh, I had a senior general ask me if the Secretary of Defense had sent me to the Army with secret instructions to shrink it more, because the Army is you know, sitting at the Navy table, its chair, sitting at the Air Force chair. I was, so the, Navy, the Army always feared they were going to be a bill payer for some of these big technological investments uh, of the future. And that's not why Carter sent me to the Army. He didn't talk about that at all. He did say, you have to get them away from talking about themselves as a number, A, and B, 450, 480, 495, 20, whatever it is, is not the number because that's just the active component. And we cannot do what we're asked to do if we don't think um, as, as fully as possible as a joint force. Uh, all three of the components are important. But you know, the, the number by itself doesn't really tell you a lot. Um, there is a lot of analysis behind the number, but you can't, th there's no precision to this because it's all about risk. And so you can come up with these different numbers uh, in the context of the joint force and then des describe what the risk is in certain scenarios. Um, you know, there's no question that, that the Army is being uh, worked hard. The 450 target for the active component, when, when that was agreed to, because all this takes time to, to implement and to, and to achieve, was uh, before Russia was being so provocative uh, uh, on, the, on the border with Eastern Europe, before China was getting um, uh, uh, more provocative in the, in, in the Pacific, before we saw what ISIL was doing uh, in Iraq and in Syria. And as I said, soldiers already in 150 countries a day as it is. And so there's a bit of a stretch there. But I, but I caution people to get away from thinking about it just in terms of force structure numbers because 
Um, if that's the focus, to not be 450 but be 490 or 520 or whatever it is, uh, you could end up creating greater imbalance and actually lead to more hollowness uh, because uh, those people cost something. We need to make sure if we have that number that we also have the money to keep them trained and to equip them. Uh, and then there's tail. That goes into the future for a very long way. So whatever your future modernization plans are, they're over a larger force. So I think it's important that we, uh, we don't oversimplify these things about the, the number of soldiers, the number of fighter squadrons, the number of uh, carrier strike groups, uh, and think about the totality of what it means to have them and have them ready. Right. And as far as the analysis, uh, there is no shortage of analysis on any of these things. Um, we could all do a better job of communicating uh, the analysis and what we're thinking and the context around it. There's no question about that. But again, this all then, you can do all the analysis you want, and it gets down to judgment calls and, and conversations about risk and about balance. Art, not science. Uh, um, yeah, and as a guy was saying to me yesterday, uh, you know, it's unclear which Trump will show up to govern. On one hand, he's sent the message that there are inefficiencies even in, even in DOD. Um, on the other hand, like, probably wants to send uh, you know, more money toward, toward the building. I, 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 there's no question there are more efficiencies to be found in an organization as large as the Department of Defense. That's never, that process should never stop. Um, but I think uh, we have sort of approached efficiencies over this administration of kind of identifying them and taking the money before we necessarily implement them. And we haven't caught up. So I, I would caution about banking on those dollars right away, but I absolutely would say don't ever stop looking for, it's not just efficiencies and pulling money out of the system. Uh, it is doing business differently. You know, we used to drive technological change. We think about stealth, the internet, GPS, what have you. And, 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 and we still, we do incorporate and field technology very well, but in many ways we cannot keep up with what the private sector is doing and how the private sector iterates on technology. And so it's not just changing to get more money out of our system, it's changing to partner better with places outside the Department of Defense that are doing things we need to embrace. I had another question, but you've greased the skids so well for my next one that uh, I think a previous, um, I think Senator Cotton was here, and I think he's one of several people who have pushed the Army on you know, buying off-the-shelf stuff, commercial stuff that's available. And as, as you're familiar, uh, there was a ruling uh, against the Army for essentially shutting out uh, one particular tech firm uh, who wants to do work. Now, uh, Palantir. Um, when you work for Secretary Carter, certainly you're aware, and you know uh, Carter has pushed this idea of bridging the gap between the building and the and Silicon Valley. Um, I know you're not going to comment about the legal issue, but can you kind of talk more broadly about is the Army open for business with tech firms, and is it willing to embrace off-the-shelf stuff, which is cheaper, typically cheap, typically cheaper, faster, ready to go? Yes, uh, there is more work to be done, which was which uh, I intended to be a real focus of mine. Uh, General Milley's really, uh, you know, interested in that as well. I, I believe the faster you get things into the hand of soldiers, the better, because um, we'll they figure out how to to learn how to adjust how to use things differently and give us feedback very quickly. Some of that's off the shelf, some of that stuff we's or, we already have that we can modify. Uh, it's not just Silicon Valley. Um, first of all, technology is not just Silicon Valley, it's not just Silicon Valley. There's a lot of creativity and innovation in our defense industrial base. We need to find better ways to partner with them as well. We need to open ourselves up to all of this because technology is being developed differently and in faster and faster and faster cycles right now. Uh, and we need to change to, to be able to get that in and field it and get in the hands of soldiers faster. So absolutely, um, you know, one of, the, one of the many nice things about having lawyers around is they tell you a whole bunch of things you can't talk about, so they <laughs> shield you a little bit. So I, can't, I cannot talk about that case. Right. But I hope we use it and, and all other cases as a learning opportunity for how can we do things differently. Um, because I do think uh, in, in some ways we're speaking different languages now and we, we need to figure out how to collaborate better. Right, because it seems, you know, we can sit here and I think anybody would agree with kind of what you're saying, um, but the, the military bureaucracy can get in the way and uh, doesn't always get the memo about what leaders 
want to achieve. Yeah, but it's, and, it's not just, it's some, um, you know, I, I keep going back to something Secretary Gates said when he had his farewell address, and he said bureaucrats and bureaucracies are different things, and nobody suffers the bureaucracy more than the bureaucrats have to fight it every day. These are rules and procedures. If bureaucracies are additive. If something go bad, and, and they're always steering by the wake. Something bad goes wrong, you add a process to prevent it from happening again, and you layer, and you layer, and you layer, and you layer, and you, layer, and you create a whole bunch of people whose job is to say no. And we've got a lot of people who, who do want to get to yes. And that's one reason we set up the Rapid Capabilities Office to try and field some of this stuff faster. And it's not meant to be a workaround for the entire acquisition process. We need to keep reforming that and making it more agile and responsive. All right. Um, my kind of ink, but what I call an ink block question, kind of back to where I was going to go, is you know, because we are uh, where we are in terms of military strategy overseas, and what did you say, 150 countries, the armies deployed, to, but not in huge numbers, right? And uh, people associate the army with huge numbers generally. And so my question really is: is is there? Does the army suffer from some kind of identity complex? because we're not doing what people generally associate the Army with doing, major occupations, big forces. You know, in some ways, that's, uh, that's a question you could have asked me in any of the jobs I had in any of the military departments. I do think that... Before you worked for the Army? Before I worked for the Army, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Get um, more candidates. Yeah. <laughs> Many jobs in the Army as well. The, uh, they, the services do, try to, do tend to focus on that tip of the spear kinetic thing, because um, that's what they identify with. And, and what I found moving from service to service, and no more, more so than with the Army, are all these unbelievable other capabilities they bring to, that are required for the Army to be the best Army the world has ever known, but that they bring to the joint fight and that they bring to the coalition fight as well. And it's, a, it's an impressive group of, and I don't even like the word enablers, because I feel like it doesn't give enough power to what that part of the army is. And, and we have thinned that out a lot to support that tip. And so that's, that's been a, a struggle. Um, but I don't think they have, I, I don't see any sort of existential issue about being spread thin in small groups over 150 countries. It does impact how we're structured. Um, we've proposed setting up train, advise, and assist brigades that are smaller than a regular brigade because right now when we create those, we, we take the leadership out and a part of the brigade, we separate them and it, and it impacts our readiness um, to recognize that we are fighting in many different ways and working in many different ways around the world. Are you, is there a readiness argument to be made for, um, I mean, I think everybody's kind of lining up to, to make a big argument, and you potentially won't be here to make that argument with the new folks on the Hill, but is there a, what's, what's your kind of a general assessment of Army readiness right now? We're, we're on a path to get to our readiness goals, um, really in this, in this fight up. Uh, but, um, you know, they say in the military, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and the, the enemy gets a vote, and we don't know what we're gonna be asked to do in the next five years. And, and I, I, I'm cognizant of the time I want to just say one thing. I get asked all the time, what's the biggest threat to the Army? And there's two ways to think about that. Uh, what is the, ge geopolitically, what is the biggest threat to the nation, to the Army? So that's, is it Russia, is it North Korea, is it ISIL? But I, I think of that question in terms of my Title X responsibilities as Secretary of the Army and the Department of the Army, and in many ways I'm a CEO of a business unit. And the biggest threat to the Army that, I, that I've been working through and to the Air Force and to the Navy and Marine Corps has been the budget instability. And so all these issues that we're talking about, readiness, technology, modernization, force deployment, if we had some uh, more stable baseline which to plan, we could, I think, get to a lot of our goals faster. Okay. Um, I know we had two seconds left, but I know a guy. Um, <laughs> just quick, what are your plans, uh, assuming that things uh, end for you next, uh, next few months? So I, I, uh, I, I, my, my model in all this was, was the man who hired me out of college, uh, one of the two, Rudy de Leon, who in the Clinton administration had four jobs and ended as deputy secretary. And I'm like, well, that's what I want to, in the Obama administration, I want to stay eight years. Um, if I can have four jobs, that'll be great. I had nine, so I overshot <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and 
pace myself but be tired at the end so that I, I know I've, I've contributed. And so my plan was always to be someplace really warm come January 21st. And that's, I mean, I, we are committed to doing whatever the incoming team needs for us to do on the transition. And some people stay and some people don't. Um, but the, the plan is to, to take a break and, and uh, figure it out later. I, this is, this is uh, an amazing job. It's a huge honor. I, and it's a struggle every day, but a, but a joy every day. And I don't want to waste any ergs thinking about what's next and getting caught in the maw of the transition, because I've been through a few of those. And they, the anxiety grows in a way that's suffocating. And so I'm, I'm going to just hold the stick until they drag me out of the building. And then I'll go and rest for a while. And we may see you again. <laughs> Secretary Fanny, thanks so much. Gordon, okay. thanks very much. I appreciate it. Good to see you.